Gold Invest. Explore opportunity. Hi, everyone. It's Peter Schlow here, President and CEO of Heritage Mining. We have our structural advisor, Brett Davis. Thanks so much for coming. I know you're uh, very busy, so it's nice to see you again. Yeah, thanks, Peter. How are you going? Yeah, you know, living, living the dream. Uh, <laughs> just finished up a, a bit of a road show, and it was got in late and up early, so happy to be here. For those listeners that, that aren't aware of, of your, your global status, if you could walk us through maybe a bit of background on yourself before we get into the technical details of the Drayton Black Lake property and the quartz vein that we've stumbled across here. Yeah, for sure. I'm not quite sure about this global status thing, but I'll, I'll give you a potted background. You know, I, I, I did my degree and then I ended up as a production geologist at one of the largest base metal mines in the world at Mount Isa. I spent a couple of years underground there, then went and did a doctorate looking at structural processes. And then I did another six years of research, postdoctoral research, got a decent publication record in international peer-reviewed publications. And then I went back into industry as a consultant, both internally to a number of companies, dominantly gold-related companies, uh, before starting my own consultancy. Uh, one of those companies was actually a Canadian one. It was uh, Dundee Precious Metals. So I worked as an internal consultant for them, working between Canada and Eastern Europe and Armenia and Australia for, for a while. Over the last couple of decades, I've been working as an independent structural geology consultant, and I've also been annoying hell out of people on LinkedIn. I've got a substantial following of over 36,000 people on LinkedIn, regularly put out contributions. I'm also uh, the editor for geological content for the world's largest virtual drilling magazine, Coring Magazine. And on top of that, I also supervise um, postgrad students. So I've got uh, co-supervision of one PhD student at the moment. And uh, in between that, you know, I um, I don't know. I don't really have a lot of spare time. I, I need to retire. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're glad to have you here. But it's been it's been you know, almost a year now when we were back in the uh, in the Mafic volcanic contact and the and the Lake of the Bays Batholith chasing that those 1930 was it 1936 1937 holes but I think what everybody'd like to hear from you is you know walk us through kind of what happened in that core shack when you and I were there and then maybe uh, take it all the way and and you know why this why this is interesting now given what we know yeah for sure so for anybody listening, my experience in this belt was fairly minimal to, to say the least. It's a little bit of a different pedigree to what I'm used to in that there's lots of small greenstone belts in this part of the world as opposed to relatively extensive ones like we have in Western Australia. But that said, the similarity is they're both very gold endowed. Also, there's a similarity in that the greenstone belts in your part of the world and the stuff we're looking at in uh, Ontario is that the gold historically has been located and prospected for and discovered within the greenstone sequences. So the felsic units, uh, the, the large internal granitoids, these things have been something that have, have never ever been looked at in any great detail. And if you step back and look at the maps and you look at the distributions of where mineralization is, you get lots of stars on spots in the greenstones, which are mafix and ultra mafix and metasedimentary sequences, but you really don't see much within the felsics. And th that's par for the course. And I must admit, that's more or less what I expected. And when we first looked at the stuff in the core shack, I was a little bit surprised because the style of mineralization and, and the rocks it was hosted in were not typical for what I expected for the orogenic style gold mineralization that, you know, is advertised and touted for this part of the world. What it looked like to me, having seen a few of these systems, was that we actually had an intrusion related component to the mineralization. And that was fairly exciting because there's some pretty significant intrusion related deposits around the world. Sometimes they, they can have high grade components or sometimes they're very large with um, low grade. So they, they make volumetrically very good deposits. 
The interesting thing for me, though, was it actually opened up a lot of exploration potential because we were now looking for a different style of mineralization, and it potentially said that instead of going outside of the granites into the greenstones, we could go inside and into the intrusions and open up a whole new perspective within the belt. And looking at the timing of the mineralization relative to the host rock, so going through constructing a geological history, doing the overprinting, looking at the ages of the structures, it became apparent there was an overlap in time between the gold and the igneous intrusions. So given the host rocks, given the relative ages and that, it was one of those things where we thought, geez, let's, let's turn the rigs around and, and let's have a look at stuff internal to the granite, be informed about the structures that these things are hosted on. So these things are still structurally hosted. And we, we sort of came up trumps, you know, we hit a massive quartz vein, something we, we would never have expected. I, I Correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but I think we hit a, something like a 70 plus metre intersection of quartz, which uh, recently has come back with anomalous gold in it. I mean, that that is significant. Yeah, the, so that was, that's hole 13 and that's shown above right here in the graphic. It might be helpful actually just to walk through what we're seeing here. This is something that I refer to quite a bit in our presentations and, and has been worked up by our team and including yourself. But I mean, we're, we're looking at a, you know, two to four kilometer strike length, but you can see the, the contact here and how there's a, a magnetic structure here, but maybe you could walk us through kind of you know, what, what you think the next steps would be and, and, you know, how we're, how we're going about looking for the next discovery in Northwestern Ontario. Yeah, th this, this was an interesting one. So we had the technical success of hitting a mineralized structure inside the granite, but then we actually had a hole that had not too much inside it. And then we had another hole, which then had quartz intersection again. And you, you start thinking, wow, um, maybe this isn't continuous maybe that was an anomaly but in looking in detail at the textures in the core looking at the geophysics it appears that we were unlucky enough to actually drill through the intersection where we had a slight fault displacement and we drilled through that fault displacement through the main structure so it does appear that we do have a, a relatively continuous strike length structure which to me is it's exciting because Commonly, if you, you have a good strike length, then you've got a good dip extent as well. So down dip, this thing has probably got some, some legs as well. When we've put other holes along it, you know, we, we're still hitting significant quartz intersections. And if you look at the size of the vein, and then you, you take that as an analogy to where you see other big quartz veins elsewhere in the world that have gold mineralization, the gold is never, ever uniformly distributed through them. And, uh, you know, you get nugget effects, you get different ages of quartz comprising the vein, and only some of those might be the same age as the gold. And it looks like in this that some of the gold is associated with sulfides, which might be of a younger age than the, the vein itself. So we're still overlapping in time with the intrusive system, but the actual quartz phase is one of many. So we've still got a few technical challenges ahead of us, but the fact that we've got anomalous gold over a significant strike length within the intrusion, I think opens up, um, you know, some very exciting potential. And, and going forward, you know, we're going to test, you know, along the length of that. First pass is, is probably just, just to do some surface geochemistry to see if there are particular spots along there that are preferentially mineralized. Yeah, and that, that's what we're, we're planning to do that. So we're, we're looking to do, we've announced that we're fully permitted for stripping. And we are going to start mobilizing as soon as possible some some soil and geochem. I know you did a nice summary for us on Zone Three. Would you want to touch on this slide and and kind of the intrusion related mineralization events that are associated with this? Yeah, so I guess the the one significant thing about this is uh, th this is a summary slide where. The geological history you see at the bottom written as summary has actually been condensed and distilled down from a much wider history that comprised all of the overprinting and geometric events. So multiple events, which we then group into episodes at, so that we can make it you know, legible and, and you can tell the story from a, from a simple diagram that gives all the salient points. And the salient point in here 
is that dashed rectangle. You can see that the red at the top is the age extent for which the igneous intrusions have been coming through. And the final gasp of that is what overlaps with the gold. And I believe that that has been instrumental. And this is not just my own bias and the overprinting relationships I'm seeing. We've also engaged a intrusion mineralization related expert in Greg Morrison. Now, Greg Morrison's got a, an incredible pedigree. He's worked on everything from epithermals through to porphyry deposits. He's, uh, he's looked at many of the big deposits across the world, and he's also a very accomplished geochemist. And he basically backed up our story saying, yes, there is an intrusive component to this. So we've got the intrusive chemistry We've got the overprinting relationships, we've got the structural relationships, and we've got a very large structure. You, you add all those in together, we have got a, a model, you know, that we're, we're obviously trying to break rather than test. You know, every time you try to break it and you don't, that adds more credibility to your story. And so far it's working and, and the technical success of finding a big structure with anomalous gold in it is testament to that. So going forward, I think that this model works and it's really, really exciting. We're not following up the old story of orogenic gold. But that said, what this does is this is an extra arrow to the quiver, really, in that we have got intrusion-related mineralization as well as orogenic style mineralization external to these plutons. So for me, you know, that's great. You've got two different types of mineralization styles. You've got significant size structures. You've got anomalous gold. You've got a model that's making sense. That, that for me, is what keeps me going with this. Brett, taking a step back, and then this is a bit of a dated map, but looking at this is where zone three is, and this is where your our mag anomaly is. But Taking a step back, when you were initially on on our property about a year ago, there was a structural area of interest that we've we've outlined here and overpinned with some historical geophysics. We've had we have a, a few old mine shafts from the 1930s here. So just wanted to maybe if you can touch on you know the these are I, I would presume orogenic related deposit potentials or ex, for exploration to further our exploration efforts and then this is the new granite intrusive style mineralizations so would you want would you mind touching on that yeah for sure so for people listening the background and pedigree to this is that when I was first involved with the project, not knowing any better, I was looking for orogenic style mineralization. And the first thing that I do is I say to people, give, give me your geophysical data. Don't give me your geochemistry and certainly don't show me where the mineralization is. And from that, I will do a blind interpretation of what I think the belt architecture is. And then using the, the knowledge of orogenic gold deposits globally, the ones I've worked on, the ones that have been documented in the literature, go to those sites where we're seeing similar geological attributes to those hosting deposits elsewhere and identify them. And that was what was done. The belt architecture was put together. The areas where we thought there was higher potential for the discovery were then highlighted, which is areas that Peter's got on there as the um, elongate ellipses. And then once I've done that from a blind, hopefully objective point of view, we then put the geochemistry over the top of it and we put the historical workings over it to just see how much credibility there is behind the interpretation. And what you find is that, you know, some of the, the old workings fall into those areas that we have considered to be of interest. And from that, we then highlighted zones where we wanted to go and look. And obviously, if you want a big deposit, what you need is you need big structural connectivity and permeability. We're not after a small deposit, we're after a big one. So we're looking for the big structures, big architecture, and we've highlighted those there. And at the time, the intrusion-related gold story had, hadn't even reared its head. And it was only when I went over to look at the drilling into our orogenic targets that I thought, wow, okay, we've actually got a different beast here. And we've added the intrusion related story to this, which is that checkerboard of small squares in the, uh, uh, that's under HML new claims in the sort of middle of that diagram. We've added that to 
the orogenic style gold targets on that map. Okay, Brett, just uh, wanted to, to wrap things up here, but also bring everything to, to top of mind. We, we do have, uh, you know, we've identified a globally significant structure with some anomalous uh, gold values that, you know, make this area interesting in, the, in a new style of mineralization. We got a great graphic here on the typical mineralization associated with gold that you're going to see. Everybody listening to this from a, from a technical perspective and non-technical perspective would love to hear your thoughts on, or maybe a walkthrough of what you think about the rocks and the gold associated and, you know, the rocks in general, now that we have a, a, a graphic here. So if you wouldn't mind walking us through that, that'd be greatly appreciated. Yeah, no problem at all. Uh... Look, to argue with you a little bit, Peter, I know you've just said this is a great graphic, but it really doesn't demonstrate the extent of the zone of interest because what you see there with the, the white and the grey and the pink, if you lay out a lot of the whole, what you do when you step back is you say, wow, that's really impressive because you have tray after tray of that. And those colours exhibiting the influence of multiple stages of fluid ingress. And you have multiple stages of veining, multiple stages of alteration, and within that you have sulphide. So the, the dark spots you're seeing within that is molybdenite. And interestingly, across the top of a lot of that is you have textural development in the terms of a tectonic foliation as well. And sometimes those sulphides are aligned within it. And what it's telling you is that you have the influence of fluids going into those rocks, you have intrusive activity going on, and you've got mineralization entering those, those rocks at the same time. So you've got coeval fluid ingress and deformation and igneous intrusions. And that is a recipe for something really, really interesting because you have got meters and meters of this. And it, it is really interesting for me because it's not often you see such well-developed or, or such extensive alteration over such volumes. I'm hoping that this is representative of what we're going to see along the length of that structure. 